Hi, I'm Wes Kim, board president of Seattle Permusica, and on behalf of the board, staff, and singers, I'd like to welcome you to the first episode of Choral Tapas, our new series of bite-sized virtual concerts. Until it's safe to perform together in person, we'll continue to practice safe physical distancing, rehearsing and recording from our homes, so that we can keep sharing the beauty of choral music with our community. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that here in Seattle, the land we work, play, and live on is the traditional land of the Duwamish people, the first people of Seattle. We honor with gratitude both the land and the members of the Duwamish tribe, past and present. In support of the Duwamish people, Seattle Permusica makes an annual donation to Real Rent Duwamish. For more information on how you too can help fund social, educational, health, and cultural services to the Duwamish tribe, please visit realrentduwamish.org. Thanks again for joining us today, and now please welcome Karen P. Thomas. Hello, I'm Karen P. Thomas, Artistic Director of Seattle Permusica, here to welcome you to our first installment of Choral Tapas. Over the next few months, we're going to share with you these bite-sized concerts that combine music, snacks, and beverages. In each segment, you'll enjoy a pairing of two choral works, one old and one new, complemented by an appetizer preparation video by Seattle Cucina Cooking School and a signature cocktail demonstrated by Seattle Permusica's executive director, Katie Scovold. And each time we'll share the recipes in advance so you can cook, stir, or shake along with us. For this first choral tapas segment, we bring you music by Mozart and by contemporary composer, Marcus Garrett. Before we dive into the music, Let's get ready for your happy hour experience with this tapas demonstration by Seattle Pro Musica alto, Erica Wiseman of Seattle Cucina. Hello, Erica here from Seattle Cucina Cooking School and welcome to the cooking portion. I'll be guiding you through a classic tapas dish, patatas bravas, um, and that essentially means spicy potatoes or even bold potatoes. The bravas is where that's coming from, but everyone in Spain, especially in Madrid, knows this uh, tapas very well. Typically, you buy some alcohol of choice or drink of choice, um, and then with that drink comes a free tapas. So let's get going. We're gonna begin first by getting our potatoes roasted in the oven. We need to preheat our oven to 450 degrees Fahrenheit. We are essentially oven frying these suckers. And then the next step is you're gonna to wanna to peel all of your potatoes. Today I'm using Yukon Gold. Patatas bravas are known for the size and that's kind of important. You want it to be about an inch, maybe inch and a half. It's two centimeters. Um, if you're using Yukon Gold, it's pretty simple because you can probably just cut it in half and then cut each half and half again. But we want them roughly to be about the same size. I'm gonna go ahead and add my third cup of olive oil into my bowl. And then we have some garlic cloves. I did crush them a bit uh, just to kind of get the juices going, but we do wanna leave the peel on um, because these potatoes are gonna roast at a really high temperature. Your garlic might burn. And that's just going to kind of season your whole dish. You can eventually eat the cloves too if you'd like, but go ahead. It's about six cloves that I'm throwing on in there. And then one of the most important parts a lot of kosher salt. I recommend kosher or sea salt. Be generous if you can afford to be generous with your salt. And then once your oven is preheated, go ahead and dump these bad boys on a heavy sheet tray, dumping out any excess oil if need be. If you see these guys are kind of like swimming, swimming in olive oil. I'm gonna take a moment to flip all of my potatoes onto their biggest sides. This is gonna ensure maximum crispiness. And then once your potatoes are laid out like so, a little bit of space all on their flat sides, you're good to go ahead and put this into your preheated oven. We're gonna set a 20 minute timer and let these guys roast on this one side. And then we're gonna come back to them and flip them onto another side and let them go for another 15, 20. So you can expect to have these potatoes completely done within 45 minutes or so, but let's go ahead and get these guys in now. 
while I roast a little bit about uh, the patatas side of things, potatoes are native to the Americas. So they didn't make it over to Europe until probably early 1500s, and they were not popular for about 200 years. But then after war and uh, various famines, people discovered how versatile and filling potatoes can be, and they became extremely popular in the mid-late 1700s. So I thought this was kind of perfect, the Mozart piece, um, that probably when he was writing and, and alive, he probably had some potatoes around. He probably knew about potatoes. While they roast, let's go ahead and make our two sauces. For the salsa brava you'll need a small or medium sized saucepan and in it I've added my olive oil and we're heating that over a nice medium heat. Once it's nice and shimmery you are welcome to add your minced cloves of garlic which I'm just using about two maybe three. I want to talk a little bit about the paprika that we're using. There's dulce or dulce and picante and we want to use more of the dulce that is uh, sweet, right? Sweet smoked paprika. And then picante, you can imagine, is the spicy. But most paprikas you find in the store will be dual sick. In Madrid and throughout Spain, people are particular about the kind of brava that they make. If you do have a spice that you love and you want to make it your own family recipe, you're welcome to play around with this. I'm going to slowly pour this guy in, making sure my heat's probably now at medium. Just add a little bit and then give it a really good whisk. This step ensures that it's not going to get super duper lumpy. A little bit more. And we do want to let this simmer away. That's essentially going to cook our tomato paste a bit and then just help bring together all the flavors. It gets too thick to you. Go ahead and add a bit more water. Aioli time. I have two egg yolks already separated into a nice sized mixing bowl. We want plenty of room. You of course can do this in a food processor if you've ever made aioli, but I love showing how to do it just by hand because it's kind of, it feels easier to me for some reason. I have four cloves, very finely minced garlic. You can of course do more or less garlic depending on your taste. And whisking that up. And I'm gonna take a second to really whisk my egg yolks It is done, it should be nice and thick. If you want a thinner sauce, you are welcome to add a little bit of water to thin it as needed. Now we just season to taste. Salt and uh, lemon juice. Well, there you have it. You are so welcome to just dump this all over your potatoes if you'd like. You can of course use it a la like a dipping sauce. Family style, I like to go ahead and put these in bowls and allow people to decide for themselves. It is smoky, it is tangy, uh, it's crispy and crunchy, nice and brown. Oh my gosh, potatoes, right guys? So thank you for a fun cooking demo. I hope you enjoy your patatas bravas and I look forward to making another classic tapas with you next time. Bye. Thank you, Erica. That looks amazing. The first piece we'd like to share with you today is Mozart's Laudate Dominum, one movement from his larger work, The Solemn Vespers of 1780. This was the last work that Mozart wrote during his years in his birth city of Salzburg. He worked for eight years at the court of the Archbishop Colloredo from the age of 17 to 25. Mozart was only 23 when he composed the Vespers, which would have been performed in the Salzburg Cathedral as part of the liturgy with breaks in between movements. Many years ago, I was lucky enough
to catch a performance of the Solemn Vespers in Salzburg at the very cathedral that Mozart wrote it for. It was performed as a liturgy with congregational singing in between movements. And the sound in that reverberant acoustic was phenomenal. I will never forget it. Mozart's appointment in Salzburg had been secured by his father, Leopold, and Wolfgang was generally unhappy during this period. He frequently butted heads with his employer, who had a reputation for being demanding and unpleasant. Archbishop Colorado was conservative in his musical tastes. He banished overly ornamental elements from religious practice and insisted on shorter musical settings of the liturgy. Mozart was expected to compose within these bounds, and he did not like that. So Mozart was quite restless in his post as concertmeister for Colorado, bored even. Before taking the position in Salzburg, Mozart had gained a taste for cosmopolitan fame. Though still a teenager, he was fulfilling opera commissions in Italy, writing instrumental music for the local concert scene, and touring in Italy, Munich, and Vienna on the side, all of which interested him much more than writing church music. The archbishop also restricted Mozart's ability to travel and thus to promote himself. Mozart did relish the travel opportunities that he got. In a letter to his mother, he lamented leaving Munich after the premiere of his early opera, La Vinta Giardinera, saying that he was happier to be in a city where he could breathe. You see, the problem Mozart faced is that he was a budding international celebrity, but he was just 17. Too young to make it on his own, and too young for the more fulfilling job of Kapellmeister. And without the ability to travel, the opera invitations from Italy dried up. Mozart yearned for greener pastures. His dissatisfaction came to a head in 1777 when his father Leopold wrote a letter to the archbishop asking for permission to go on travel leave. Colorado ignored the letter for a month and finally responded by firing both Leopold and Wolfgang. Although Leopold actually stayed in Salzburg, Mozart took the opportunity to go off touring again. But after a few years, he ended up right back in Salzburg, his father having guilted and bribed him to returning to take a new position as court organist. Mozart was extremely unhappy about returning to Salzburg, a place that he had grown to truly resent. His letters from the time curse the people of Salzburg and mock its provincial musicians. Though interestingly today, Salzburg makes much of its reputation as the birthplace of Mozart. His image is everywhere in the city, epitomized by the local confection, Mozart Kugeln. In any case, Mozart only held his second post in Salzburg for 22 months. After taking a commission for the opera Idomineo, Mozart received his final discharge from Archbishop Colorado. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, he did not leave on amicable terms. In a letter to his father, Mozart said he was released from service with a kick in the... <clears throat> So while Mozart may have been unhappy working in Salzburg, choral singers everywhere are the very happy beneficiaries of the great choral orchestral works that he wrote during that time, including this beautiful Laudate Domino movement from his Solemn Vespers of 1780. Our performance features soprano Jenny Spence, pianist Dwight Beckmeyer, and the singers of Seattle Por Musica. And now with a few personal words about Laudate Domino, here is one of our singers, Marilyn Collier. Hi, I'm Marilyn Collier, a soprano and sometimes first alto with Seattle Pro Musica. Uh, I've traveled many thousands of miles from my home in Gig Harbor to sing with this most excellent Seattle choral group. Most of us probably have had experiences, those moments when we have heard someone sing or play and our breath has been taken away momentarily by that experience. Perhaps the experience I most remember specifically is hearing the wonderful soprano Carrie Takanawa sing in Pasadena, probably in the mid 80s. And she sang this wonderful piece by Mozart, Laudate Dominum. It's a gentle, beautiful piece that she sang so incredibly beautifully. It is unusual in that talking about the power and the glory of God in gentle terms is so interesting. And I remember saying after that, those notes ended, that was Mozart at his most sublime. And I still think that and think of that performance. So now enjoy so the soprano Jenny Spence singing with Seattle Pro Musica, 
Mozart's Laudate Dominum. Hi, I'm Katie Scovold. I'm the executive director of Seattle Pro Musica, and I would like to make you a cocktail. To make this cocktail, you will need the following ingredients. And the following implements. I've called it the Restless Amadeus because the experience that Mozart had while living in Salzburg was bitter and sorrowful. He felt cooped up. So the bitterness in the cocktail is the chinar, but there is also the promise of bright sunny days ahead, which we have represented in the lemon and the sweet vermouth and uh, the rye is just for fun. 
This is a dark stirred cocktail. So you could serve it in a rocks glass or you could serve it in a coupe. Let's make it. The first thing you want to do is prepare your garnish. This drink is finished with a lemon twist and we will express the oils over top of the glass. So we need a nice wide piece of lemon. Be very careful of your fingers. Go straight in and as close to the edge as you can. You also need lemon for the cocktail itself. I like to use this guy. Lemon juice, straight in. Your rye whiskey of choice. There are tons of types of whiskeys in the world. Scotch whiskey, Irish whiskey, bourbon, rye. Uh, rye's been having a resurgence in the past few years. And rye must be made with at least 51% rye. It's characteristically a little spicier than bourbon. I've tried this drink with bourbon and the sweetness of the bourbon is too much. You need that spice to sort of balance the deep depth of Chinar. And into the glass. An ounce and a half of Chinar. One ounce of sweet vermouth. I like Carpano Antica Formula. It's a little fancier than your normal vermouths, but don't use a bottom shelver for this. It'll be too brash and you won't get that sort of mellow, deep, rounded flavor. And orange bitters. A couple of shakes. It's a lot of bitters. Think of bitters like seasoning. This is a well-seasoned drink. Most stirred drinks are booze only. You wouldn't normally stir a drink with citrus in it. That's because most drinks with citrus, you want that sort of violent aeration to break up any pulp, make sure you get all of the juice, and many drinks with citrus tend to be frothy, so you want that sort of boublage action happening in a shaker. We stir this drink because the lemon juice is in such a small quantity and because we don't want any froth here. It needs to be a smooth experience. And stir. You'll be stirring for, depends on your ice. If it's already started to melt, if you've got a hot room, you're gonna get the dilution a little bit faster and you won't have to stir as long. If you've got really cold freezer ice, you might need to stir longer. If you want to make it go faster, you could crack a couple of the pieces of ice first. Uh, you'll have more shardage in here, uh, but we're going to use the fine mesh strainer to get rid of that. What are you looking for to know when you're done stirring? The outside of my glass is now very cold and you can see the condensation forming on that. Uh, get your glassware of choice and ditch the contents. And we're gonna double strain this drink, which um, you do when you have something that you want to, you wanna catch any, like I said, shards uh, or any lemon pulp. You would also double strain things like egg white cocktails so that you're sure to get all of the little bits that are not as pleasant. We want it to be smooth. Strainer over top, position your glass, fine mesh strainer over top of glass, and here we go. Your final move is to grab your pre-prepared garnish and express the oils from the twist over top of the drink. That'll add that final like, ooh. Finish your twist, rub it around the rim of the glass, drop in your twist. This is the restless Amadeus. Cheers. This is a very fine cocktail. It is herbal, it is balanced, it's got that sort of bright hint 
from the lemon. It's got the depth and richness from the combination of the sweet vermouth and the chinar, and then it's also got chinar's characteristic sort of um, deep, bitter quality. If you like gin and tonics, if you like IPAs, I think you'll like this drink. If you don't like those things, you want something slightly less bitter, sorry. Thank you for coming on this journey with me. I hope you make the Restless on the Days. I think it is worth your time. Uh, I think a bottle of Chinar is worth your investment if you like things that are bitter and really, please enjoy the rest of our Coral Tapas presentation. The Restless Amadeus is a delicious cocktail. And now we move from the late 18th century to the present day with a new choral piece by Marcus Garrett. Marcus is a composer and conductor working at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, where he conducts the chamber singers and the university chorale and teaches choral literature and conducting. Dr. Garrett is also busy as a guest conductor and clinician with choirs throughout the country his choral and vocal compositions are performed across the U.S. to great acclaim. He's also very active as a choral music researcher, and I think his most exciting contribution is a database he has compiled titled The Non-Idiomatic Choral Music of Black Composers. As Marcus himself says, non-idiomatic as it relates to black composers refers to the original concert music that is not part of the traditional idiomatic canon associated with black musicians. That canon includes spirituals, gospel, jazz, hip hop, and rap, among others. This database of original choral music is an invaluable resource that I have used to search out choral music by black composers, especially since traditional publishers tend to mostly publish arrangements of spirituals and gospel songs by black composers rather than their original works. For any of you who would like to delve into this database, there's a link to it in the notes for this broadcast. The particular piece by Marcus Garrett that we want to share with you is My Heart Be Brave. This is a beautiful setting of the poem titled Sonnet by James Weldon Johnson. In addition to being a beloved poet of the Harlem Renaissance, Johnson was a civil rights activist and leader of the NAACP during the 1920s. He is perhaps most recognized today as the writer of the lyrics for Lift Every Voice and Sing. I think that Marcus has perfectly captured the power and hope expressed in this text of My Heart Be Brave. Before we sing it for you, here's one of Seattle Per Musica's singers, Megan Leffering, to share some personal insights. Hi, my name is Megan Leferink, and I've been a singer in Seattle Pro Musica for eight years. My Heart Be Brave is a secular anthem by Nebraska-based composer Marcus Garrett. The text is by American writer and civil rights activist James Weldon Johnson, a leading figure in the Harlem Renaissance. To me, this piece is a reminder that it's worth it to do the hard thing, to strive for justice, even when it seems like things aren't getting any better. There will be a brighter morning, this piece says, if we all strive together. I'm glad we get to share this message with you today. Please enjoy.
It's Katie Scovold, Seattle Pro Musica Executive Director, back this time in my official capacity to ask you to consider supporting Seattle Pro Musica. This content is free. You can support us with a financial donation via any one of the links in the description box below or by going to seattlepromusica.org slash donate or texting the word choir to the number 44321. You can also support us by sharing this content with friends and family via social media, send it in an email, and don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss future choral tapas. Seattle Pro Musica counts on the support of folks like you to continue making this sort of content. So thank you so much for everything you do for us. Thanks so much for joining us for Coral Tapas. I hope you'll join us for more. Our next bite-sized event is on March 13. We'll enjoy music by Gabriel Fauré, as well as music from and an interview with contemporary composer Melissa Dumphy. I'd like to thank our Coral Tapas team, audio engineer Kevin Wyatt Stone, video editor Wes Kim, Seattle Cucina co-owner Erica Wiseman, cocktail maven Katie Scovold, Seattle Pro Musica's Operations and Administrative Associate Joshua Gailey and all of SPM's fabulous singers. You can find information and schedules for upcoming programs at our website, seattlepromusica.org. Until next time, cheers. <laughs>